no matter what we think now, that it is changing. The people coming out now are different. And uh, they are not putting up with this. This is how we always did it. Welcome to the Shipping Podcast, where I meet interesting maritime professionals sharing their passion for the shipping industry and their everyday job. I am your host. My name is Lena Gothberg. Hello, Shipping Podcast lovers, and welcome to episode 184 of the Shipping Podcast. Whoever you are and wherever you are in the world, thank you for tuning in. This is where we talk about the coolest industry on the planet and help raise the maritime industry's profile. In this episode, you will have the privilege of listening to Pernilla Trigg, She went to sea in 1996, then studied to become a chief engineer and today is the proud owner of a ship trading to Svalbard. Svalbard is a Norwegian island midway between the northern coast of Norway and the North Pole. The vessel's name is MS Stockholm. A grand old lady built in 1953 and I will include a link in the show notes of this episode where you can see some beautiful photos and video clips of the ship. Panilla is also referring to episode 109 with Cecilia Osterman, who also is a chief engineer, but who decided to go ashore and to become a researcher. It's an interesting episode. So the link for episode 109 can also be found in the show notes. By the way, if you don't know what show notes are, it's essentially a written post on the website or on the mobile app that relates to the content which is covered in the podcast episode. I have written 184 show notes as well, if you haven't noticed. So, without further ado, this is Panilla Trigg for you. Welcome to the Shipping Podcast. Could you please introduce yourself? Hi, my name is uh, Panilla Tri. I'm a marine engineer, ship owner from uh, Sweden, w- West Coast, small place, um, Hamburgsund. It um, used to be in port for old sail uh, ships when they were trading with cargo. And my family had been in uh, shipping for quite some time, some generations back. I've been living here and... Um, since I was a kid and uh, traveling a lot with the industry, obviously. Uh, how come you became a, a chief engineer? Well, I um, I was not supposed to be sailing at all, but uh, after some traveling uh, when I was backpacking, and as, as you did after high school, I was sent back earlier from a trip to Bali when it, some rainforest started uh, to be on fire. And I ended up in completely the wrong time in October in Hamburgsund and didn't know what to do. And my dad's previous employer asked if my brother could come out as an AB. And my brother was already out working. So, but he said, my daughter's here, so she can come. I was like, but what? I didn't know that, but I did. Uh, so I actually started out as an OS then because I had no papers. You could do that. This was back in 97, 96. So what is an OS? You are talking to a land crab. I don't know anything about these abbreviations. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I signed on as an ordinary seaman, as in um, the very starting position on deck. And uh, after, I think it's 18 months, you can uh, you will be an able seaman. That would be as a rating still. You can do that without going to university. And then you have the same system in engine. But um, I started out on deck. But on this vessel, MV Ortviken, there was a female engineer that was promoted uh, first engineer on the sister ship, Obola. And she asked me if I wanted to join there and come and work in engine. And I was like, yeah, sure, I can do that. And that was interesting. I had never thought of it, but that was interesting when you got down to all the systems and what's happening in the heart of the vessel. And so, so that's how I ended up at sea. <laughs> that was not the plan to start with. 
Yeah, but you were recruited by by a female uh, engineer from from another vessel. That's probably the first time I've ever heard about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, she was she was um, second engineer on the Utviken, uh, and so we talked a lot when I was there as uh, OS, and w- that's when she. So we had met before, Osa Tivelius. She's uh, she's great, and um, uh, so then when she was promoted, uh, she brought me over. So that's how I ended up. Both at sea and in engine, not really planned. So where did you start it then? In Gothenburg or in? Yeah, uh, yeah, that was in Gothenburg. Yeah, I was sailing for a couple of years because I had my time, eighteen months, to come out as a motorman to get the certificate. But this was in 1999, and at that time, um, the Swedish TAP agreement came through, temporary employed personnel, uh, which meant that most jobs for ratings sort of disappeared. They was completely hopeless trying to get a job when you were all new, no experience. And uh, I I actually signed up for the university because at that time I had realized that I want to do this. So so I started at university at 99 uh, to get my engineer's degree there. But yeah, that was interesting already then talking about we don't have personnel enough and then how do we get them? <laughs> And we are back uh, on the same track again now because it goes up and down. Oh yes, I've heard this for twenty. Yeah, yeah, I've heard this for twenty-five years now. Uh, it's some eye rolling going on when I hear that, actually, <laughs> because uh, yeah, because it's interesting that we can't plan for it. Yeah, they were talking like yeah when I started at university, they they were talking about this massive lack of officers coming up because of retirements and. Uh, how, you could easily see how old people are. That's not going to change. And now 23, 24 years later, yeah, same discussion. We don't have any people. It's like, no. I mean, that's the one thing you know. If you don't have juniors, you're not going to get seniors. And yeah, you start to get tired of that talk. <laughs> so maybe they are trying to, to uh, do something about it by uh, talking about all these remote controlled vessels then. Because then they don't think that we will have need for any seafarers oh yeah oh sad to hear yeah it could could be some part of it i don't think you're still going to have to have very skilled people ashore to do that and um just to see we we, we have <laughs> last couple of years obviously been uh, going into the digitalization a lot more but just to see how it's not that fast as we think it's the technology needs to be so much more developed and it has to be run by people who still know what's happening. So you're still going to have to have skilled, experienced people ashore. And where do you get them <laughs> when there's no seats on board? It's, uh, I think it's fascinating that we still... That this has been talked about for, the, for my entire career through the industry, actually. So I don't know. It's, it's the future and... Um, don't know how it's going to be run, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah, we will see. So you have your own ship now. Yeah, I've been when I was out sailing uh, as engineer. We, you, you know, you work your um, turners like six, four, six, eight weeks on, and then time off. Uh, I was working in the North Sea, uh, Norwegian shuttle tankers, and um, on the time off, uh, I was working on this little vessel, MV MS Stockholm that is um, going uh, to Svalbard in the summer. And uh, that was my time off. So I could be there very relaxing. I was an engineer, but she's tiny. And uh, and I've been there since 2008 on my time off. And then a couple of years ago, me and my business partner, we bought it. And uh, there's a pandemic closing down Svalbard. So that was good. <laughs> We're waiting for it to open now. <laughs> but it will. But but she's an she's an old lady, isn't she? Stockholm. She's old. Yes, uh, she's from 1953. She's really really pretty. There's a few sister ships uh, left from a series built by um, Swedish maritime organization at the time, and uh, they were trading uh, around uh, for pilots and uh, measuring uh, sea depths and charts and things like that, and then. Uh, my um, mentor, sort of, up there, Per Engvall, he bought her 25 years ago, and then he had already had the sister vessel for some years trading on Svalbard. So 
when we started up there and we just want to continue, he's still in the business now. So we have him uh, as a co-owner as well. It's completely different what I do for at work, the shipping industry at work, but uh, you, you have it small scale. You have everything that was back in the old days where you have to, you don't have internet, you don't have the connection at that time. We have all safety features, obviously, but it's so much more relaxed and slow and you're there just to look at things. It's really, really nice. You should come. How many passengers are there on board? Oh, she's a cargo ship, so there's 12 passengers. She's uh, 365 uh, tons, so she's very small. And um, we have a crew about five to seven, depending. Uh, we, we are chartered by a um, uh, travel agency, so, so they bring on the customers and um, we make sure we come from A to B. Sounds fascinating. It is. I've never been to Svalbard. What is that like? Calm, quiet, ice, clouds, whales, bears light in the summer now it's very pretty now it's snowy and uh, northern lights and the dark is fascinating but uh, you can't go there it's too much ice now and you can't be there in the winter you don't see anything and there are polar bears so you would have to stay on board but in the summertime there's still polar bears but it's a bit easier to see them (laughs) but you've been traveling there a lot then for a long time do you see the changes the climate changes and all of that have you noticed anything about it yeah, we talk a lot about it. It's hard to say. Obviously, it's there. But it's hard when you try to pinpoint that the ice is melting, that um, the glaciers are... You could see it on the glaciers, actually, that uh, they are withdrawing a bit. The ice up uh, in the north, is uh, it's floating. So it could. It's very, even if it's not much, you can still be stuck in the ice. It's not like it's a big ice cap, as in the south. And there, some years, there's... Uh, lots of ice you can't even get a, around the entire island but other summers there's nothing and that could, that comes from winds and currents it's not that it's more or less ice in that sense it's how it's how it's packed or not packed more so for this time for these 10 12 years yeah you can't a little bit it's so much talk about it but that's an interesting place because you have a lot of uh, history and a lot of photos from 100 years back and 150 years back. And then it's quite obvious. You can see it, how the ice is uh, withdrawing. And that's it's sad to see. And also, is it coming back or what depends? You can see it also that the currents are changing and the water is getting warmer. My My business partner, who's a fisherman, so he immediately spots that that type of fish is not supposed to be this far north and those things that I don't have a clue about. But uh, if you say so, that's true. So all the signs are there and um, things need to be done. And then what to do is, uh, that's the big big question. Mm. We try to, I think as we go, obviously we are very careful when we travel around up there and uh, also, they're quite regulated on how you can go ashore and you go, you're go. you always with guides and um, you don't leave anything and you're being taking photos and things. But it's, it's also a thing to show this is what it used to look like. This is what we have that we need to preserve as well. Could be double, <laughs> could be double to actually trade up there. But also you, there's so much to see both with history and the nature and uh, to not show it that it's better to see it and to try to preserve it to have an idea of what we are about to lose if we if we don't get a grip i would say if we go back to your ordinary work then yeah (laughs) what what are the biggest changes that you have seen during your career that's a hard question i've been skipping around uh, through segments in shipping Uh, i was first sailing as engineer and i was on new building yards and then I was inspector on drill rigs and then I started ashore I've been on class societies I've seen a lot of I've been changing spectrum and well you have more digitalization now but it's not that much more and it's quite slow this this has been happening more those these last two years in the pandemic than it has in the first 20 years I was working interesting 
Yeah, now I've been working uh, the last few years as a surveyor, where we go uh, out and do um, inspections and surveys of ships and safety and, well, hull and machinery is the class thing and safety is usually a flag, but we do both. And that's important work to make sure that we have a fleet that is uh, up to standards. And some of the change in this industry has been that all of a sudden digitalization is going fast uh, but also that now everything takes five minutes so you don't need an administrator anymore i was like yeah uh, yeah we do we do we very much do so when when it's not really um, uh, when the top and the salesman for the for the programs is not uh, communicating then uh, it all ends up on the operators which is usually that's us the middle segment there and we're supposed to Everything is supposed to take five minutes, but it doesn't. And that takes time from the actual work on board where we're supposed to do the surveys, inspections. And then we have to struggle also with uh, this is same on the all the companies I've been working with. It's everybody's struggling with it. We're we're definitely on the wrong on the right uh, way forward. But it's been a little bit quick that all of a sudden everybody's supposed to know how everything works that you haven't worked with specific programs and I do not want to say that we're going to go back from this uh, digitalization and making it easier, but just to think that it's running itself, that this program is so good that you don't need this and this personnel. Uh, We do. We do indeed need that sort of personnel as well. So over the years, it's um, since I was there before internet on board, (laughs) that's uh, hard to say, but I, uh, with internet and with all the connection to have this close contact to shore is one of the bigger changes i think Uh, that all of a sudden everything is really urgent everything has to be uh, done now answer now and the pace has speed sped up a lot but also during holidays and (laughs) when when shore base is uh, not there then it's a little bit more back to normal so i think that the information speed on how fast things has to run has uh, changed a lot since I started. What is the reason for the problem that everything has to take five minutes? And uh, what is the problem? Is it the problem that the systems are new or that the people who are developing the systems do not know what it, what it's like to be on board? Or I don't, I mean, just give me uh, something to... I've been been thinking a lot about that. I mean, the intentions are really, really good, but I think it's it's a bit, the, the different segment that, I mean, the, the younger ones coming out now, the 20 plus people, everybody expect them to know everything, uh, internet, as everything digital on their fingers. And the really top segment, they have, they buy a solution that someone explains that this is going to show, it's going to make it this much more efficient. And, Somewhere in between, there's the people like me that are supposed to both do the job we usually did with, which was a full-time work, and then also do the full-time work of one, two, three administrative people that they did do things. I mean, they are the, usually they are the magical hands behind it all. And I'm not good with that. I mean, I'm, I'm quite useless. So it takes a lot longer time for me to figure out what they do in two minutes. And then with the new programs, then it's new to everyone. And of course, when it's running smooth, it's going to be, it's going to be good, but it's never going to be five minutes. So we're joking about this five minute thing. It's like, no, it's never going to be that. So there's um, a transition period now that's going to be ongoing for, well, in the pace of our industry, it's going to be quite a few years yet before we're there, which is fine. But then we would it would be better to have everyone involved still, not just to put it over to one segment. Now you do it all, and it's there's no it's a lack of realization on how it's actually working. That it's uh, it isn't five minutes, and the programs are good, but we still need to to set off more time than is allotted. So, and I think that I saw that both uh, I've seen it as inspector as surveyor. It's it's all over that it's um, these new tools, they are magical. So all of a sudden time doesn't 
exist anymore. And if we can cut a little bit there and we can save a little bit there, obviously we need to. But at some point you're saving too much and it starts getting expensive again. I think also that we lack some sort of standard, standardization in the industry. Because if we had the same systems everywhere, then everyone would know them. Yeah. It's like... uh, I am not sponsored by Microsoft, but if I were, <laughs> I mean, everyone <laughs> knows how to use Word or, or Excel or something. We didn't know that when they were first introduced to us. No. But now everyone you speak to knows about that. And and if there were systems that were the same for the maritime industry, I don't know if that is possible, but probably, probably very expensive as well. <laughs> but But then everyone would know. <laughs> Yeah, but, but I can say that that's usually what's what we end up with anyway. I can on uh, all these. Uh, I've been using. All, I've been working as a maintenance superintendent when you're implementing different uh, programs for the maintenance on board, and then you're supposed to use one program for everything, not have your own little Excel sheet on the side. I'm yet to meet the chief engineer that does not have an Excel sheet on the side because the programs are too. They are too massive. They they are brilliant, but they do too much. And when for the people on board, that, that's supposed to be a tool to help us, not an extra chore to do at the end of the day. That's when you start losing both the use of it and um, faith, and also the information. Yeah, and then, and then you have people ashore that is pulling information out of it that is not correct because you haven't had the time to put it in. Mm. Which is the, and that's where you start clashing. And then, oh, you have to use that program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then the login isn't working or the internet isn't there or all that stuff. So we, we're coming back to that. Everybody, everyone I know has, they have their Excel sheet. They have their word. They have on the side, the thing that we should absolutely not have. That's definitely what we have. So that is the <laughs> international uh, language on board. But also there are very good programs to use could be that some of them are just overcomplicated. They can do too much. I don't need it to make coffee for me. I need it to not order an extra cylinder when I just want some spare parts. It's uh, it can be it can be too much. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. So what has it what has it been like to be a female engineer on board a ship? It's been good. It's been fun. I have um, I have been thinking a lot of that since Me Too came out. Uh, I've always been thinking that I've been quite lucky. I I haven't had um, like I say any problems like that. And when you start thinking, there's been incidents that would obviously not have been okay. Sure, the culture have have been and is still, I would say, different. We we are accepting things. That that is not here. Uh, when I come out as a surveyor now, I see this twenty-two-year-old uh, girl in engine room, and the guys start uh, not too harsh, not too severe, but they start joking around, talking and pushing the boundaries a little bit. They still do it, and I can see that she's she's not comf- She's trying to be one of the guys, and it, I get really sad. That that's me, twenty-five years ago. Nothing's happened in that. It's not, it's not real bullying. It's not hard. It's, but you have this attitude that, yeah, it's a man's world. You have to toughen up. It's like, one, the guys are not that tough. They are not. And it's not their world. I mean, it's not hard. It's just, it's just to go and do the job. But when that is accepted on all levels, it's not changing. And the level of acceptance that, I mean, things that I... I've never been afraid. I'm 180 and I've been, I mean, I'm usually the same size as a lot of the guys and I can be quite rude, not rude, but I can be quite uh, pointy. And also, should that, should I have to? I have, uh, just because I was never afraid, it's not okay. I've been throwing hand, I've been manhandling a guy out of my cabin, throwing him into the wall opposite the cabin and he his nose bled he was bruised no one said a word about it everybody knew I wasn't afraid I was really furious this was a Swedish ship 20 odd years ago and when you see that nothing's happened on that front and also 
imagine you at the office that you actually punch a guy in the face. He's bruised. Everybody knows why. And nothing happens. I wasn't, that's the problem because I wasn't scared and I didn't even think of it. I was just solving that problem that what the F are you doing in my cabin when I come up from the watch two o'clock in the night? And he had a position where he had a master key. So he was literally in my cabin. And this is just one of the things. But imagine if you could not manhandle the guy out of your cabin. And should that be a requisite for working on board? I don't know. But this is the things that it's really negative. I mean, I still love the job. And uh, I... I like the way of living and working and you do get sort of an expanded tolerance on board for people that are annoying and things. But when it comes to that, that so many uh, women are actually scared on board, that really got to me. It, um, it came quite hard when uh, Me Too came out here. I agree. I cried. Yeah. You get quite, uh, I get a big lump in my throat and, not not for myself, but that's also how how can it be when I see that girl again in engine room that used to be me twenty years ago. How, I mean, what, what, how is she feeling when she she goes to bed at night? Is she locking a cabin door, or should she have to? You probably play a, an important role for young women who are entering the industry because they can see that you are doing this, so it's okay that they do the same thing become a chief engineer I mean yeah but then again it's the responsibility of the others to make sure that everyone feel comfortable in their working space I mean that is what we say everywhere but if they don't do that we need to change it and I think as long as we don't speak about it we can't do anything about it we have to acknowledge it everyone has to I mean for instance Why didn't they ask you that you were harassing him, <laughs> sort of punching him? That would be another question to put. Yeah, indeed. And there's been, yeah, there's been more uh, severe situations as well. But it, and that's that's a symptom of how how bad it used to be. That okay, everybody knew that that guy was doing these things, so no one were really surprised. Yeah, but still, it's uh, either either it was. He still had his job. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, his dad was a chief at the vessel, so. Yeah, but still. <laughs> I know, that's even worse, that, you know. And uh, what I'm hoping when I see, I mean, I'm trying to really push it now. When I come out and meet uh, young women on board, it, I'm pushing quite harsh back on the guys when they, when they are joking around too much. I can be, I mean, I've heard it all before. They are not even original. I've heard it 20 years ago and I very glad to tell them that that's old but also to make try to get um, both sides also to get the attention that you can speak up that this you don't have to do that and but not i don't want to step on their toes, toes either in case they are fine i mean you just you just want the atmosphere to change when it comes to what is not okay and it's really hard to put a finger on it For for me, that wasn't really scared, but I'm um, knowing now that so many women are quite afraid at work every day. I don't know what to say. It's terrible. It's terrible. It's sad. It's not okay at all. Because no. if we are, this is. I think we are talking nowadays a lot about all the seafarers that couldn't go home because of the pandemic. It was impossible to, to change yeah. crew and so on. And they were impo- it was impossible for them to trade. Yeah, young people also read about that when they are reading the papers or the news. Yeah, And then we're talking about this harassment, bullying and all of that and a, and a bad culture. Yeah, they read about that as well. Because everyone reads about that. Yeah. It doesn't really help our brand as an industry no. to still have those uh, spots on our shield or whatever we should call it, <laughs> on our cape if we are if we are super women. Um, we don't want those stains on our cape because then the young people will see them as well. Yeah. We want to show how much great things there are in this industry to work with. You can do so many different things. 
Oh yes, that, yes, yes. That's that's the big issue too, because with all this and it tend to, all discussions now tend to come to this point where all this terrible things that is happening, but that's still not still a very very small part of my of the life on board. I'm not saying that it's not a big thing for people that are suffering from it, but. We also like to say we need to attract people that want to come on board, do the job and see what we're actually doing. The only things talked about for shipping is usually really bad things. It's me too, or it's a disaster, burning ships or grounding or collision. And that's what we hear. But the work on board with you, normally it's really, really good gangs on board. These uh, incidents that is happening are isolated in my case some other have really really bad problems with it but now we have the chance to also change it we we cannot stop talking about it it's not good it's not good to attract people but we have we have to bring it up now because now we can change as well and now we cannot the companies sure they can no longer say they don't know and that could also encourage the women on board to speak up hopefully it can change because everyone we are on board your you're on board there's no, whether you like each other or not and everybody wants to have a good atmosphere on board so all the guys as well will uh, they will uh, benefit from having a better situation on board and i remember cecilia was talking about the safety issue just to have i mean if people don't talk the way you, we have to communicate on board and you shouldn't be hesitating and it feels quite terrifying to know that that could be a situation that you don't dare to speak up because you've had enough of harassment from the person you have to speak to. And in the end, even the the ones responsible for the safety issues, and we have all these uh, administration, we have the ISO, we have the ISM, we have all these legislations already that is hard to, it's implemented, but it's usually implemented to a compliance department that is taking care of that but it's supposed to be a part of the entire operation. And I'm the first to say that's a challenge to try to to get that into normal day working operation, but that is the top management's job to make sure it happens. And if it's not coming from there, you're never going to get the people at the vessel to do it. And it's not because we on board are, it's not that we don't care. It's just that same as when you get in too complicated maintenance system that is telling you you're an idiot and it's right, then you ha- end up with a system that you just, ugh, you do the bare minimum you have to because it's an extra chore instead of a help. And then you have your little side sheets there with your Excel and Word document to make your workday work because that's always worked. And it's running and this is functioning. And then once a year, someone comes on board, sometimes me, frowning my brows and asking, have you done this and that and where's the checklist? And that's completely different to normal day operation, which is absolutely not what it's supposed to be. So we have all the tools. They are just not incorporated correctly in everyday operation. But that's what we have. And it's not going to go away. It's here to stay. So we need to make it work for us. And it's good tools when it's working. But that has to come from top management. Top management is responsible. And if they want to delegate, no problem, but they have to be aware that then they have to delegate. They can't be not aware of what they have as responsibility. No, you're correct. But it's a hard question. It's, uh, um, I could imagine it's hard to acknowledge that, uh, oh, I have a problem in my company or in my team or in my ships or whatever. Yeah. And that's probably the same for every every top management in every type of company out there. But but um, oh yes, yeah, me too. Did a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's not that it's it's not that they don't want to. I, I think that they they really don't know. Same as before, that the information is not coming, not not from the top down and not from the bottom up. So it's not bad intentions in any way. It's just that it might be too much, too divided. And it's not in, in, integrated enough to be working through the entire system. And um, the, the, the first ones to start 
now to actually admitting that we have a problem. The first one sticking out, that, that's really brave. And that's really, really good setting an example that, okay, we have the problem. Uh, we didn't know. Now we know. Let's solve it. Yeah. That's brilliant. And we, we have that. They are coming up now. <laughs> I would use it as a marketing tool to, or, or uh, yeah. I mean, a branding of my brand to recruit young people. We have had this problem. Yeah. We have addressed it. We don't have those problems anymore. No. And we are aware. Yeah. Our super women cape is completely fresh. Come and work with us. Yes. Yes, absolutely. That that's the best one. That's the one you look for. The the ones who admit that okay, we we have this now. We we see it. So we're on it. And uh, yeah, that's brilliant. That because the next generation is also very into values and things like that. It's important for them to know what the company stands for and, and the values that and they want to share them with the working place they are entering into. So we need to tell them. Yeah, they need to know that the, it's, uh, it is going, the, we are going forward. We, we're a bit slow, but we are going forward. And also the values everybody's talking about now with the environment and we are working on all the values and shipping is very good for the environment, for transporting and logistics and everything. And if we can just continue on that uh, trail and also include this issue since also use it for, for whatever it was worth with me to, it, it really proved that all industries in all uh, land, shore, base, everywhere, it's everywhere. So let's just address it and go on and uh, work with it and see it. I think that could uh, actually attract people that knows that it's there because like you say, it doesn't matter if we say nothing, this comes out and this is what the young people hear, but also answer it then. We, we are working on it. So then we can get them to come back. Or we have solved it. Yes, obviously. But also we have solved it with the fact that we are keeping our eyes open for it. We will see if, if it should occur again, we will be there. But it's also a matter of leadership. Yeah. I mean, I, I haven't studied to become a master mariner or, or a chief engineer, but do you also learn how to become a good leader when you are educated? No, not, uh, well, it's been quite a few years <laughs> since I was at university, but not for us. We didn't have maybe what, a couple of weeks of psychology. Well, I, I don't know, but, but I hope that at least you get to know something about leadership and organizations and teamwork and all of that when you are becoming, because, I mean, we also got the problem or problem, whatever, uh, with the hierarchy within our, you know, if you are the captain of the ship, you are responsible and you are the team leader and, and so on. And there is nothing to discuss because yeah. if you start to discuss who's, uh, who's in charge of the ship, <laughs> once you are in a trouble, then it's too late. Yeah. So, so there is this hierarchy with, with the, um, I am the captain, I decide. So you got that as well, on top of everything else? Yeah, we had some minor courses in uh, work psychology and things, but I, I would assume that there's more of it now. But also, it's a good point that should come, I, I would say that it should maybe come later when you start, uh, when you're getting up a senior, maybe you should do some more training on it if it's needed. Some people are natural leaders, some are not. But when it comes with a the position, then then you have to do it. And uh, maybe it could be uh, that you need some more training or just accept that uh, I, I know other things better than this. Or, But it's also very hard because you, you look at the ones, you look at the older generation and at that time this worked, nothing wrong with that. But since the entire world is changing now, it's going to change quite fast for my generation. We come from, like I said, no internet on board to, to now. And we are looking at the generation before us, but we need to lead the people coming after that are sometimes the 20 something are space people to me. And uh, usually it's quite, it's quite good to know that we don't understand each other, but let's talk about it then. 
So because it's a safety issue on board as well, that uh, back to being able to communicate. Mm -hmm. So how do you see the future? How do you see the future for the maritime industry? Yeah, you talked about uh, autonomous shipping there. But I, in this, I think we are we are going so quite slowly in various areas, and um, we do need to have some sort of uh, collected goal to attract people that want to stay and to to see where we're going with all the climate issues and all the and that's really hard for shipping as well. But I, th- I think it's hard to say really where we're heading. Where do you see progress today? I mean, you, you you are on board different kinds of ships and, and you are doing inspections and things like that. Where are we doing some progress for to, to reach those goals for sustainability that we are looking for? There's lots of innovation going on, both on the larger ones and also the, all uh, sizes of the shipping are t- t- testing and trying out new types of fuels, new, new uh, steering edge, uh, how to run the ships. There's lots of tests going on and uh, need to have to know what, where to go on uh, both on uh, on the political scene as well. That wh- where are we heading? What are we looking forward to? We need to have a steering from that side. If you start investing, it's a very, very heavy on investment side for shipping. So if you're investing a lot of money into something, you you would need to be able to trust that this may be possible to run in the future as well that it's not being shut down politically and uh, to have maybe stability in the that's that's about my my very great but up to the political standards on how how do we want it and that can't be country by country it has to be europe us or best of all worldwide global so to get the same standards to be able to run on the same terms Mm. Did you have a role model growing up? No, maybe, no. I wasn't supposed to do this at all. I was going to be working maybe as a researcher alone with no people around reading all the books. That was my dream when I was little. So I have my grandmother. She passed just now this March. Sorry to hear. Yeah, she yeah, that was it's really sad. She was but she was 95 years and nine months and uh, she had a very very good life and maybe even more now when I've grown up to see all that she was she's been through my granddad he actually picked her up in Norway during World War II he hid her in his uh, boat sneaking her out from the Germans and smuggling her into Sweden and they and then they were running these ships together he was Uh, sailing with cargo and she was coming with him with the kids and you know one of these no really hard-working women but not working uh, as they did she was alone most of the time or traveling in the summers with granddad and during my grown-up years I've been talking a lot with her she's talking a lot about you get a bit perspective when she says that the best invention ever was the washing machine Then I hide my smartphone and say, yes, you're right, Grandma. <laughs> It's uh, giving you some perspective. <laughs> yeah, but that's good from time to time to have a perspective on, on your own life. and, and uh, Yeah, really. Both what the elderly generations did, but also for your kids or for younger people. Mm. Mm. I don't know if you have a family or... No, I have cats. Yeah, good, <laughs> good cats. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> No, but sometimes, um, because I consider myself uh, being a little bit uh, a tech nerd and interested in new things and so on. And then someone said today to me, have you looked into the mirror? You look old. <laughs> and What? Then I, and not, not, I, she said to me, well, uh, you just, you could just look in the mirror and you, you look like uh, women your age. Uh, okay. <laughs> does that even mean and i think i'm so much more modern yeah. than the rest of the ladies in my age uh, so so we were laughing a bit about that ah uh, that's uh yeah but you, i get that from my niece as well it's like she's she's 20 uh, and uh she's like yeah but in your generation 
I think uh, I have a cool phone here. <laughs> it's, yeah, not fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's not fun to hear it. Yeah, and, and then you think about, I mean, yeah, there are all ages on board. I mean, a team on board mm-hmm. uh, includes all ages and, and both sexes and, and maybe some more people who are diverse in, in their thinking or in their way of life and so on. It's not easy. It's not easy to get a team no. to work together. You probably know that from your hobby with Stockholm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, that's very important. She's so small as well. So, and we are, there we are recruiting friends, basically. That uh, if someone knows someone that could fit into the team, that's uh, obviously with the certificates and that, but that's that's how we run. She's so that's small scale, but that's the way we try to do it because you're and that's uh, you're even uh, worse off with no um, internet no yeah we have internet every day 10 day or something like that so but uh, on board the the bigger vessels when you're out there it's it's equally important to have the team and no matter what we think now that it is changing the people coming out now are different and uh, they are not putting up with this this is how we always did it they just don't and then it doesn't really matter what the older generation as myself uh, what we think and how we did it we're still gonna have to to integrate it because we need to get more people in and uh, as i said i'm one of those who's been wondering for the past 25 years when are they coming in they when i started out there was a lack of people then we can't do the same thing we need to make sure we get people in and the the new generation they have more i think they have more demands and they they don't put up with it which is good yeah but there has to be there has to be um some sort of communication because when you get the wrong person on the top on board then they just says this is how we do it end of story i don't think i hope we don't see that much anymore but when you have it it's going to clash mm. so mm. So in and in the middle there's there's us forty-ish that's been both on <laughs> the mobile generation and on the this is how we always did it generation. So we are the schizophrenic ones that are trying to get this together, hopefully. I think you are, because just <laughs> by being who you are, I think you are contributing to to developments and, and to the future as well. Because we need more women and we need more yeah. engineers and we need yeah. more people who speaks up and, and from what I can hear, that is what you do. <laughs> yeah, you have to. I grew tired of not long time ago. I got I grew tired of not understanding what was the under meaning and things like that. So I just started being quite blunt and that's fine. That's good. Uh, we're talking about work most of the time. I can be sensitive when I'm talking to people about personal stuff. But <laughs> at work it's good to be quite clear and And also to ask them, that's actually one of the, I would say one of the plus of being a woman when I was, especially maybe as first engineer, when the the guys came on board and the junior engineer second and third, when they had some problems, night watches, it could be easier to talk to me than to my reliever. And uh, it could be good to know. I don't mean, I don't need to know what's in their personal life. But if you news, you notice when someone is not okay on board because we are tight knitted. Working close together. Yeah. So it could be quite good as well. There are quite a lot of uh, upsides as well that should not be forgotten. Mm. Obviously it is because we're still there and it's still fun. We just need to continue on that route. Who do you think I should invite the next time? Who do you suggest? Who would you be interested in listening to? I would actually like to hear... No, I'm continuing on my friend Sofia's trail here and recommending a friend, uh, Anna Carlson. She's HR manager at Clotel in Gothenburg. I know her. Oh, uh, great. Uh, maybe I'll ask her if she wants to yeah. come on. Yeah, that's yeah, a great idea. Please try. We need HR as well. Of course we do. We need everyone. Yeah. <laughs> so we need and we need to hear them talk about it. Yeah. I think yeah. it would be interesting. I agree. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me, Panilla. I think it was a great one. This was great and and I'm happy to have had the chance to talk to you. Uh thanks to Sofia. 
<laughs> Thank you talking to you. It was really fun. Thank you, Panila, for this candid conversation. I might take you up on the invitation to go to Svalbard. For those of you reading my newsletter, you know that I have been very upset about a maritime conference with 52 speakers, all men. Today I got an invitation yet, and instead of just deleting the mail and be irritated, I started to read the speakers list and got more irritated. There are 12 CEOs listed as speakers. And they are all CEOs of companies with the publicly communicated ESG and or sustainability strategy. How is this possible in 2022? This event is a pay for play event, like most events in the maritime industry. If you sponsor the conference, you get a spot to speak. Or this is the way things were done before pre-pandemic, you know. I think everything has changed now. And if we are going to change this industry and attract the next generation, we cannot keep a concept where only people at the sea level can afford to sponsor the conference and be invited to speak. It will be an echo chamber to be on that conference. Nothing is heard outside of the meeting and no new input is inserted in the people attending. They are all copy and paste. They all look the same. You can see it in the pictures from the previous year's conferences. I am not done with this. There is a list of company logos on the website of the conference. I will look up their goals for diversity and inclusion in their sustainability reports. And you can be sure that I will ask these CEOs the next time I see them why they are not willing to contribute to the necessary change of our industry. <sighs> Until the next time, from me to you, over and out. Thank you for listening to The Shipping Podcast. Don't forget to tell everyone that you meet that there is a shipping podcast available and that they should download it and listen to the maritime professionals who are sharing their passion for the shipping industry. 